This episode is sponsored by Skillshare. If you see an 80s Hong Kong movie, you know it's either going to kick ass or it's going to be weird and kick ass. From the 1970s to the mid 90s, Hong Kong cinema stood unparalleled on the world stage, producing some of the most unique and awesome movies in history. But for a Chinese audience, things are a bit more complicated than that. Yes, you are looking at an unlicensed Street Fighters movie and Son Goku. Oh, and Mario and Luigi are in a heterosexual relationship. Look, it's complicated. Back then, Hong Kong was pumping out movies like sausages. Fast, cheap, disposable. And obviously, not all of them are good. And so, the label Hong Kong flicks gain a slight negative connotations in the 80s, often used to mean a specific subset of Hong Kong productions, movies that put sensationalism in the forefront. From Lady Terminator meets Robocop meets Metropolis to the bloodiest action movie ever made, to endless sequels to cinematic universes to all sorts of taboo and sleazy subjects like cannibalism. No matter how ridiculous, as long as the gimmick sells tickets. Today, we're going to dive headfirst into this rabbit hole and check out the overlooked and forgotten. Just how deep this rabbit hole goes? Well, all those weird and crazy movies I just showed you, yeah, say goodbye to them because I couldn't even fit them into the main body of this video. It's going to be a wild ride, so strap in. This is the dark side of Hong Kong cinema. With the success of the King Kong remake in 1976, Shaw Brothers Studio was quick to capitalize on its success. Just a year later, they would release their own giant ape movie, The Mighty Peking Man, delivering kaiju action two minutes into the film, along with a healthy dose of scantily clad blonde sex appeal, love triangle melodrama, casual racism, evil business tycoon, massive destructions, and an unexpected amount of violence. Holy sh**, this movie needs a remake! Also from Shaw Brothers is Inframan, Hong Kong's take on the popular Japanese superhero series Kamen Rider. The selling point is baked right into the Chinese title, Chinese superhero. It knows it is a knockoff and is proud of it. Dangerous encounters of the first kind has nothing to do with the Spielberg movie. It's about three kids who makes bombs as a hobby and find themselves embroiled in a psychopathic rampage. Yet. The title is so deliberately similar, the poster did an Autobot. One of the words in the title is hidden just so it looks even closer to Close Encounters. That is the hallmark of the Golden Age Hong Kong cinema, exploitation cinema. Films that chase after current trends, gimmicks come first, story be damned. Instead of relying on star power, they get your butt on the seat through sensationalized premises, and then you just need to fulfill your expectation to the bare minimum quick and disposable. This trend chasing is so pervasive at the time, entire subgenres emerge from it, such as bruxploitation. Oh boy. These are the films that were made to capitalize on the unexpected death of Kung Fu superstar Bruce Lee in 1973. The most famous of these examples is of course, Game of Death, a movie started by Bruce Lee but was left unfinished due to his passing. Enter the Dragon director Robert Klaus was hired to finish the movie using various body doubles. Now, maybe you argue that this is just paying respect to ensure Bruce's legacy is complete. But the fact that they only use 11 minutes of Bruce's original footage changes the plot so that it involves Bruce Lee faking his own death and using footage from his funeral as part of that plot point tells me that respecting Bruce Lee is not that high of a priority. Another well-known Bruce Boitation film is New Fist of Fury, a pseudo-sequel starring Jackie Chan. This is the first film in which Jackie is billed with his new stage name, Cheng Long, to become a dragon, basically marketing him as the new Bruce Lee. Stepping into even more uncomfortable territory, 1976 saw the release of Exit the Dragon, Enter the Tiger, starring Bruce Lee with an eye. 
and the story focuses on a student of Bruce Lee who investigates Bruce's mysterious death and also fights the Hong Kong Mafia. There is the Clones of Bruce Lee, in which three clones are created after Bruce's death and are enlisted as secret government agents. And finally, there's the Dragon Lips again, in which Bruce Lee, now in the underworld, fights Dracula, James Bond, the Godfather, and for whatever reason, Clean Eastwood. In the underworld. What the f While the world knew Hong Kong through Jackie Chan, local Chinese audience also knew Hong Kong for this sort of insane shenanigans. Crazy movies with the most absurd attention grabbing premises. Luckily, behind these films are talented filmmakers, and fierce market competition means the audience has standards. So, even if these movies are often rushed and not well made, they are usually technically competent and, in their own way, entertaining. The same cannot be said about the next group of movies. If Hong Kong's fast and loose way of filmmaking taught me anything, it's that making a film may be hard work, but it doesn't have to be difficult. Thanks to Skillshare, you too can learn how to make your own movies. Longtime viewers of this channel probably know Skillshare as the go to learning community for creative skills screenwriting, cinematography, editing. But I don't think I have explained the reason why I love it so much, which is because how practical and hands on the classes are. Take this class for example digital illustration, learn how to use Procreate. It walks you, step by step, through the creative process, guiding you into creating your own illustrations, which you can share with the rest of the Skillshare community, get feedback, and further improve yourself. Less than $10 a month with an annual subscription, Skillshare is also incredibly affordable. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get 30% off an annual premium membership. Even if you have already had a free trial before, you can still take advantage of this offer. So if you have a skill or interest you have yet to explore, now is your chance. Let Skillshare give you a hand and start your creative journey today. One thing to note is that all the movies I mentioned so far were made in the 70s and 80s. But until the 90s, Hong Kong cinema became the leading industry. That means Hong Kong can't just copy someone else's homework. And so, it began to cannibalize itself. This was when the endless serializations began. In 1989, God of Gamblers was released. It's an excellent crime thriller about men navigating through the dangerous world of crime and gambling. It was a huge success, launching Chow yun Fat's career to a new height. So naturally, not one, but three follow-ups were immediately pushed into production. Just the next year, there were God of Gamblers 2, the sequel to the original, All for the Winner, a comedy spin-off starring Stephen Chow and Meng Dat, and King of Gambler. That's how disposable these movies were. The multiple films a year tactic would continue through the rest of the 90s. Actors got tired of it, filmgoers got bored of it. By the time a reboot came around with the Conman series, Andy Lau, the star of the movie, looks like he's bored out of his mind. The movie just sucks all the fun out of you and expect you to pay for the service. No thanks. Another example is the Chinese vampire genre. Encounters of the spooky kind kickstarted the Hong Kong horror comedy genre. And in 1985, Mr. Vampire made Jiang Shi into a household monster. So, of course, the industry immediately rushed to this new fad. Many studios would start making their own Jiang Shi movie, multiple movies a year, one-upping each other in their absurdity. From Jiang Shi in modern day, to Jiang Shi vs Dracula, to Jiang Shi in modern day, again, to Chinese Vampire meets The Gods Must Be Crazy, narrated by the God of Gamblers actor for marquee value. And here I thought Kung Fu vs King Kong was a ridiculous concept. No doubt, many of you are tired just from listening. And that's how the local audience felt at the time, an industry scale fatigue. One of the defining features of Hong Kong cinema was the amount of excitement it offers. And when that excitement dies, the industry dies with it. And then we come to the part YouTube doesn't like. Category 3 movies, adults only. Oh my. Now, just because it's category 3 doesn't mean it's automatically spicy. On the tame side, it's barely even R-rated. From Wong Kar Wai's Happy Together, 
to Stephen Chow's flirting scholar. Yeah, how about you sick bastards saw an adult film as a kid and didn't know it? But even on the hardcore side, in true Hong Kong fashion, it usually sells you the idea more so than the actual adult content. Instead of showing you torture, it's BDSM. A lot of moaning, not a lot of gore. For example, The Untold Story, one of, if not the most famous, cat-free Hong Kong horror. Anthony Wong plays a serial killer and a restaurant owner, not a nice combo. Yes, he would kill someone, and then process his victims into meat buns and sell them to get rid of the evidence. It's that signature sensationalized premise, but the gore is actually quite minimal for an adult film. The implication, however, is deeply unsettling, and some might even say, it's actually more effective to not show you the gore. Other similar cat free horror includes Ebola Syndrome, in which Anthony Wong plays the patient Zero in an Ebola outbreak, The Underground Banker, in which Anthony Wong, okay you might be enjoying this too much mister. There's also Dr. Lamb, which is another serial killer movie filled with uncomfortable implications. Of course there are also pornographic movies like Sex and Zen, Crazy Love, and a Chinese torture chamber story, which despite the name, is actually a comedy porno. Again, calling it pornographic is really overselling it. The sex scenes are actually all really tame and, of course, fake. These movies mostly focus on risque subjects like, I don't know, having sex outside the bedroom. Crazy Love is flat out just a romance movie with nudity and sex scenes. It's nowhere as risque as popular culture made out to be. Trust me, I know far worse. But that was precisely how Hong Kong cinema operated titillating premises with bare minimum deliveries. The popularity of Catfree Frames emerged mostly as a result of market competition. With how many films were made in Hong Kong, film producers were desperate to ensure their film can stand out from the crowd. But sensationalism can only bring you so far. And as we all know today, the Hong Kong film industry just isn't what it used to be. Looking back, Hong Kong's sensationalism problem may be one of the main driving factors in ending its golden age. A lot of people blame 1997, sure a dramatic shift in political landscape probably didn't help, but the decline in domestic box office began all the way back in the late 80s. And this oversaturation of sensationalized materials was probably one of the culprits. The industry was kept alive thanks to outside markets like Taiwan and Indonesia whose markets weren't as saturated and viewers' fatigue weren't as severe. But as the Cold War ends, major Hollywood productions began entering theaters in Asia. Hong Kong simply could not keep up. The quote-unquote Hong Kong flicks got washed away by a tsunami of American films. Only the tip-top filmmakers managed to stay afloat. And after everything settled, no new filmmakers were there to take the torch. But the sensationalism is not without its benefits. Today, we listed a lot of movies, and this might surprise you, I say the majority of them are actually good, or at least entertaining. Where else are you going to find a movie about a Buddhist love story between a dog in a human's body and her owner? Some of the most batshit insane movies were made because Hong Kong had the balls to experiment. And for that, I have to give Hong Kong a round of applause.